welcome back. So today we will be getting right into the uh, backstory of Mark O'Donnell and the Palmer leaks. So if you're not sure where this Palmer, this word Palmer got into it, it's the Palmer congregation that uh, this leak came from and these documents came from. So we're going to do the backstory on Mark O'Donnell and these stolen elder files and how they finally have brought justice. So remember on our last video, it was just in the last three days, Mark O'Donnell let us all know that, uh, that these guys have been charged, number one guilty, victim two guilty. And uh, these are 85-year-old men. It's an 80, one of the guys is a, like an 83, 85-year-old man. And he is going to jail. And in fact, he's been in jail for the last 18 months because he broke his probation and he was tampering with evidence file. So this is where this case is going today. Now, one of the things I, I was going to say is uh, the Atlantic brought out that the Watchtower had to pay a $2 million fine um, in, in this instance, although they didn't uh, pay the fine yet. I think now they'll have to pay the fine, the $2 million fine for covering up uh, evidence, I'm, I'm assuming, um, instructing their elders to do that. So if you could imagine, folks, $2 million per congregation in the USA, there's 13,000 congregations. If every congregation, because we know they all have covered up CSA, and it's just a matter of time that these, these, this evidence comes forth. And uh, $2 million, if, if that's where they're at back then, it could be more coming up in, in uh, let's say, Pennsylvania or whatever. But if the Watchtower has to pay $2 million per congregation, that's $26 billion. That, 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 that'll knock a few bricks out of the Watchtower, I'm sure. Everyone says the Watchtower is rich. And then that's not to say other, other charges. So that's just uh, an opinion that I had. I was reading it in this uh, in this article on the Atlantic. So we're going to get right into the article. It's right here, uh, the Atlantic. And uh, this is an older article because this case started back in 2017, I think. We'll get into the dates when uh, Mark O'Donnell uh, had these these files. Now, this this article was written March 22, 2019. So it's a secret database of child abuse. A former Jehovah's Witnesses is using stolen documents to expose allegations that the religion has kept hidden for decades by Douglas Quentqua. And uh, that's the writer of this article. Now this fella, he's put articles out in the New York Times. He's a freelance writer. He's a good writer. And, and he's done an excellent job on this. Now... This is the article that uh, Mark O'Donnell recommended that we all get in to read. I tried to read it yesterday, but my uh, browser wouldn't allow me back in. But, you know, my good wife came out and fixed that really quick. She did something really simple by clearing my browser history. Because sometimes you only have a one shot into looking at these articles and they, they hit you up for a subscription. So, uh, thanks to my good wife, we're going to read the whole article today. So here we get right into it, uh, the April 5th, 2019. In March of 1997, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the nonprofit organization that oversees the Jehovah's Witnesses, sent a letter to each of its 10,883 U.S. congregations. Maybe I was out a bit. I thought there was 13,000. But, uh, and it says, and to many more congregations worldwide. So the organization was concerned about the legal risk posed by possible child molesters within its ranks. And the letter laid out instructions on how to deal with a known predator, write a detailed report answering 12 questions. Was this a one-time occurrence or did the accused have a history of child molestation? And how is the accused viewed within the community? Does anyone else know about the abuse? and then mail it to the Watchtower headquarters in a special blue envelope. And that became known as a blue envelope. It goes on to say, keep a copy of the report in your congregation's confidential file. The instructions continued and do not share it with anyone. <clears throat> Thus did the Jehovah's Witnesses build what might be the world's largest database of undocumented child molesters 
at least two decades worth of names and addresses, likely numbering in the tens of thousands, and detailed acts of alleged abuse, most of which have never been shared with the law enforcement, all scanned and searchable in a Microsoft SharePoint file. In recent decades, much of the world's attention to allegations of abuse has been focused on the Catholic Church and other religious groups. Less notice has been paid to the abuse among the Jehovah's Witnesses, a Christian sect with more than 8.5 million members. Yet all this time, a watchtower has refused to comply with the multiple court orders to release the information contained in its database and has paid millions of dollars over the years to keep it secret, even from the survivors whose stories are contained within. The effort has been remarkably successful until recently. A white priority mailbox filled with manila envelopes sits on the floor of Mark O'Donnell's wood-paneled home office on the outskirts of Baltimore, Maryland. Mark, 51, is the owner of an exercise equipment repair business and a longtime Jehovah's Witness who quietly left the religion in late 2013. Soon after, he became known to ex-Jehovah's Witnesses as John Redwood, an activist and a blogger who reports on the various controversies, including cases of child abuse surrounding Watchtower. And recently, uh, Mark, uh, he has begun using his own name, Mark O'Donnell. When I first met Mark in May of last year, he appeared at the front door of his modest home in the same outfit he nearly always wears, khaki cargo shorts, a short sleeve shirt, white sneakers, and a sweat socks pulled up over his calves. He invited me into his densely furnished office where a fan barely dispelled the wafting smell of cat food. He pulled an envelope from the priority mailbox and passed me its contents, mixture of typed and handwritten letters discussing various sins allegedly committed by members of Jehovah's Witness congregation at Massachusetts. All the letters in the boxes in the box had been stolen by an anonymous source inside the religion and shared with Mark. <clears throat> the sins described in the letters ranged from the mundane smoke and pot marital infidelity, drunkenness, to the horrifying. Slowly over the past couple of years, Mark has been leaking the most damning contents of the box, much of which is still secret. <clears throat> Mark's eyebrows are permanently arched, and when he makes an important point, he peers out above his rimless glasses, eyes widened, which leads him a conspiracy conspiratory air, which leads him a conspiratorial air. Yeah. Start with these, he said. And we look at the, uh, the, all the envelopes he has there. He says, over the past couple of years, Mark O'Donnell has been leaking stolen letters and other people's documents documenting instances of child abuse. So it looks like uh, this is... Uh, how Mark has been helping out a lot. So among the papers Mark showed me that day was a series of letters about a man from Springfield, Massachusetts, who had been to, and if you want to know if I'm saying that right, here's how you say it. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Sorry about that. So uh, when the man was once again reinstated in 2008, um, where is it? Massachusetts, who had been disfellowshipped a form of excommunication three times. So this guy was disfellowshipped three times. And when the man was once again reinstated in 2008, someone working in the division of the Watchtower wrote to his congregation noting that in 1989, he was said to have allowed his 11-year-old stepdaughter to touch his penis on at least two occasions. I was struck by the oddness of the language. It insinuated that the man had agreed to rather than initiated the sexual contact with his stepdaughter. After I left Mark's house, I tracked down the stepdaughter, now 40. In fact, she told me she had been only eight when her stepfather had molested her, and he was the adult and I was the kid, so I thought I didn't have any choice, she said. She was terrified, she told me. 
It took me two years to go to my mom about it. Her mother immediately went to the congregation elders, who later called the girl and her stepfather in to pray with them. And she remembers it as a humiliating experience. Her stepfather was eventually disfellowshipped for instances that involved fornication, drunkenness, and lying, according to the letters. But according to the stepdaughter, his alleged molestation of her resulted only in his being privately reproved, which is a closed-door reprimand that is usually accompanied by a temporary loss of privileges, such as not being allowed to offer comments during Bible study or lead a prayer. And the letters make no reference to police being notified. The stepdaughter said her mother was encouraged to keep the matter private, and no attempt was made to keep the stepfather away from the children. Calls to the congregation's Kingdom Hall, the witness version of the church, for comment went unanswered. By the time the letters were written, the man was attending a different congregation and had married another woman with children. He is still part of the family today. Near the end of the final letter in Mark's possession is a question. Is there any responsibility on the part of either body of elders to inform his current wife of his past history of child molestation? Mark O'Donnell's childhood was an isolated one. His parents, Jerry and Susan, had started attending Jehovah's Witness meetings in the mid-1960s. Another couple from Baltimore had told them of the Watchtower's prediction that the world would end in 1975 bringing death to all non-witnesses and transforming earth into a paradise for the faithful. In 1968, just after Mark was born, Jerry and Susan were group baptized in a swimming pool in Washington, D.C. Mark was the only child, and he inherited his father's pe peculiar love of re record keeping. Mark would show up to meetings at the Kingdom Hall with a briefcase full of religious texts. As in any religion, there's some variation among Jehovah's Witnesses in how strictly they interpret the teachings that governing their faith. Mark's upbringing seems to have been especially stringent. As a child, he attended at least five meetings a week, plus several hours of private Bible study. And on Saturday mornings, he joined his parents in field service, knocking on doors in search of converts. He was taught that most people outside the organization were corrupted by Satan and, given the chance, would try to steal from him, drug him, or rape him. Mainstream books and magazines were considered the work of Satan. If he broke any of the religious main rules, he could be disfellowshipped, meaning even his own family would have to shun him. Throughout Mark's childhood, he heard elders cite Proverbs 13 and 24. And it says, whoever holds back his rod hates his son. Mark's parents took the lesson to heart and beat him frequently. The religion forbids celebrating birthdays, voting, serving in the military, and accepting blood transfusions, even in life and death situations. Witnesses were encouraged to devote themselves to bring more converts into the religion before the end of the world arrived. Reports are heard of brothers selling their homes and property to spend their last days proselyzing, said a Watchtower publication in 1974. Certainly this is a fine way to, sp to spend the short time remaining before the wicked world's end. Some witnesses stopped going to the doctor, quit their jobs, or ran up debt. And in our area, they didn't fix their fences and all their cattle caught out. So it was just crazy what happened in 1975 with Jehovah's Witnesses. But piety, Mark noticed, did not always translate to morality. When he was 12, Mark became suspicious of a local witness named Louis Onsigrinko. I don't know if I said that right, but he was a flight attendant who would bring home Tobler bar, Toblerone bars for the local witness kids and invite them to his apartment to act out religious plays. Mark noticed on Signco touching young girls in a way that made him uncomfortable. He told an elder about his concern, but rather than take action against on Signico, the elder told him what Mark had said. Days later, Signico pulled Mark aside and scolded him. 
So, so rather than doing something about it, they went and told Insignico that Mark was gossiping or something. So he, he pulls, pulls Mark aside. So Mark's instincts seem to have been right. In 2001, one of Mark's childhood friends, Aaron Michelle Shiflet, along with four other women, sued on Signo for sexual assault. And the cases were settled out of court for an undisclosed sum. Signo died in 2016. So there, there you go. Uh, trust your gut if you're in a situation and you're looking around the congregation. Trust your gut. You know, if you get an uneasy feeling, there's a reason for it. <clears throat> to Mark, the lesson was that all the emphasis the elders placed on moral purity, there was no greater sin than speaking out against other witnesses. So, yeah, that's what happens. They, they whitewash it, and we got to keep it quiet to protect Jehovah's name. So, so the article goes on to say, it says, By the time Mark was in high school in the early 1980s and 1975, 1975 had come and gone, but Watchtower had a new prediction for the apocalypse. It said that the world would end before the passing of the generation that was alive in 1914. And at the time, the youngest members of that generation were 70, so the new prediction created a sense of urgency. My parents basically told me, you're not even going to live to graduate from college, Mark said. At age 17, despite having a year of college credit and a guidance counselor imploring him to apply, he decided to settle for a high school diploma. He was baptized and later started his exercise equipment repair company. The business provided enough flexibility for him to perform 50 hours of field service for the witnesses a month, which qualified him for the rank of an auxiliary pioneer. Though many witnesses left the religion after 1975, membership was on the upswing by the 1990s, and the organization was building new kingdom halls. Mark was installing a sound system in a new kingdom hall in Baltimore in the fall of 1997, when a young woman named Kimmy Weber asked to borrow his ladder. <clears throat> At 20, Kimmy was putting in more than 90 hours of field service a month, making her a full-fledged pioneer. She had completed a two-year program at the community college on a scholarship and would later get permission from the local elders to get her bachelor's degree. Mark was drawn to her drive and intensity. He tracked down her email address, they flirted over AOL, Instant Messenger, and were married within eight months. They wanted to start a family but decided to wait until after the arrival of the paradise on earth when they and their children would be perfect. In the meantime, Kimmy began opening their home to abused and abandoned cats. As Mark's business grew, he brought on employees, mostly other witnesses. And when he and Kimmy had saved enough money to buy the house across the street as a rental property, they filled it three units. They filled its three units with other witnesses. There were ski vacations, softball games, dinner parties, and game nights, always with friends who shared their faith. But as much as Mark enjoyed his friend's company, he started to chafe at the insularity of their social life. It felt like the intimacy and more like a self-imposed bubble. It, it, he says it felt less like intimacy and more like a self-imposed bubble. And these frustrations eventually grew into suspicions about Watchtower itself. He'd heard rumors that the organization was covering up cases of pedophilia and child abuse. But Watchtower always dismissed such criticism as apostate-driven lies. A few years after he and Kimmy married, he saw a protester outside a witness convention holding a sign that read, A JW elder molested me. I looked at that sign, Mark told me, and I locked it into my brain. I'll never forget it. I said to myself, there's no way he's lying. No one would stand out there and hold a sign that says an elder molested me unless it really happened. No way. He's telling the truth. There's a picture of Mark and his wife, Kimberly. 
Uh, it says under the picture here that when Mark stopped attending witness meetings, Kimmy's friends pressured her to leave him. Hmm. Isn't that something, eh? You'll just split the family up, eh? Typical. Now, Watchtower adjusted its estimates for the apocalypse several more times. In 2010, it introduced the overlapping generations theory, which claims that the end will come before the death of everyone who was alive at the same time as anyone who was alive in 1914. Mark found these revised predictions difficult to accept. In late 2013, Mark had an extreme reaction to an antibiotic and was confirmed to his couch for several weeks, away from the meetings and the Bible studies. Left alone with his thoughts, he began to admit to himself that he no longer believed Armageddon was imminent. The Jehovah's Witnesses, he knew, were no more deserving of God's mercy than the non-believers he'd met. And here he was, 45 years old, and facing a health crisis. How much more of his life was he willing to waste inside the bubble? That November, as he and Kimmy were preparing to spend the weekend at a friend's house, Mark suddenly stopped packing and told Kimmy he couldn't maintain the facade anymore. He never attended another meeting. Though Kimmy kept going to the meetings, her witness friends pressured her to leave her marriage. They would just come out of the blue with unsolicited advice, she told me. Don't forget, Kimmy, Jehovah comes first. At some point, you'll have to make your choice. That's, that's how the Jehovah's Witnesses talk, just like that. Put Jehovah first, you know, you're going to have to make your choice. But she didn't want to leave Mark. I just tried to figure out how can I stay a witness and him not. It's a tough decision. <clears throat> Mark's doctor had suggested that he take daily walks as part of his recovery. Kimmy already had a routine of evening strolls and he began to join her. Mark told Kimmy that he'd once planned to be an engineer and that he'd felt he'd been forced to choose between God and his ambition. Kimmy said that uh, she'd once dreamed of becoming a doctor or a veterinarian and she revealed that she'd always been terrified that having kissed Mark before they were married meant she might die at Armageddon. Can you believe that? This is, this is the, folks, this is the inculcation, the dangerous indoctrination, indoctrination of the Jehovah's Witness religion because this is exactly how it is. It messes with people's brains to a point that, that they question everything. And this is why this organization is destructive. So we carry on with the article. Uh, Kimmy, she revealed that she'd always been terrified that having kissed Mark uh, before they were married meant she might die at Armageddon. And she told Mark that she feared that at 36, she'd missed her chance to have children. Can you imagine all these people in that organization not having children because of the nine men? The article carries on. Their walks got longer, eventually reached eight or ten miles a night. And she was trying to get into my head to figure out what was going on, Mark told me. By this point, he'd given himself permission to delve into the so-called apostate material, books such as The Crisis of Conscience, a 1983 expose written by a former member of the Jehovah's Witness governing body. He also started watching YouTube videos by Lloyd Evans, a former British elder who had amassed a dedicated following with his anti-Watchtower arguments. A witness can be disfellowshipped for sharing such material, so Mark didn't tell Kimmy. Instead, he shared small pieces of information to challenge, to challenge what Kimmy had been taught, such as the truth about the 1975 Doomsday Prediction. And Kimmy had grown up believing that overzealous witnesses, not Watchtower, had chosen that date. But Mark, who rarely threw away anything, encouraged her to read the Watchtower articles, exhorting members of the faith to sell their homes. Kimmy began to entertain the kind of doubts she'd been trained to ignore. But I think the bigger trigger for her, Mark said, was when I mentioned Candace Conti. Candace Conti, now 33, was raised as a Jehovah's Witness in Fremont, California. 
When she was nine, the elders in her congregation paired her with a man named Jonathan Kendrick for Sunday morning field service. Instead of going door to door to preach the word of God, Kendrick would take Conti to his house and molest her, she says. She estimates this went on for about two years. Years later, after Conti had left the Jehovah's Witnesses, she discovered Kendrick's name on the Federal Sex Offender Registry. When she went back to the elders in her former congregation to tell them about the abuse, she was rebuffed by something called the Two Witness Rule. Rooted in Deuteronomy 19 verse 15, no single witness may convict another for any error or any sin that he may commit. The two witness rule states that barring a confession, no member of the organization can be officially accused of committing a sin without two credible eyewitnesses who are willing to corroborate the accusation. And, and by the way, folks, I had to deal with the two witness rule in business. Two elders um, pulled the rug out from under me on a million dollar contract um, and um, we were supposed to do it working together. But you see, I ha my witnesses was a worldly engineer, was the guy running the contract services, which was the engineer in charge of the building. I couldn't pull those guys in. But here this company had two elders two witnesses. And when I went to the meeting, they said, oh, no, no, it's got to be, it's got to be baptized brothers and sisters to be credible. So yeah, they threw everything out. And this is how there's a lot of scams going on within the uh, Jehovah's Witness religion where they're scamming other people out of stuff, other, other members with this two witness. So they're using it civilly within civil uh, arrangements because the Jehovah's Witnesses don't go to court. The elders are the lawyers and this has to quit. This has to stop. These elders are not qualified to be counselors, marriage counselors, uh, CSA counselors, to be lawyers for civil matters. It's all nonsense. This is all part of a great big cult. But anyways, folks, let's carry on with the article. Critics say this rule, this two witness rule, has helped uh, turn witness communities into havens for child molesters who rarely commit crimes in the presence of bystanders. The elders told Conti that without a second witness to the molestation, there was nothing they could do. And when reached for comment, Watchtower's Office of Public Information said, our policies on child protection comply with the law, including any requirements for elders to report allegations of child abuse to authorities. And the Watchtower declined to comment on specific cases out of respect for the privacy of all involved. And that's typical. Watchtower says, no, no, we can't talk. Conti asked the elders to consider a plan that she had devised for tracking child molesters within the organization. And when they refused, she sued Watchtower, her former congregation, and Kendrick. During the depositions, the elders admitted that they'd, they'd long known Kendrick had a history of child molestation. They knew before they paired him with Conti for door-to-door -door ministry and before they rejected her story about the abuse. In 2012, a jury awarded Conti $28 million, believed to be the largest jury verdict for, ever for a single victim in child abuse case against a religious organization. On appeal, judges reduced the damages to less than $3 million, and Kendrick has always denied Conti's allegations. Others had come forward with the accusations against Watchtower before, but Conti refused to make a settlement and the trial with its blockbuster monetary award became a major news story. In the years since, Watchtower has faced dozens of similar lawsuits from victims who, who say the organization's policies enabled and protected their abusers. In addition to the 1997 special blue envelope letter, these suits have cited a 1989 letter in which Watchtower discouraged elders from reporting wrongdoing to the civil authorities. And there is time to keep quiet when your words should prove to be few. Ecclesiastes 3, 7, 5, and 2. It read, Improper use of the tongue by an elder can result in serious legal problems for the individual, the congregation, and even the society. So this is all out of a letter to the elders. It was on one such lawsuit that brought attention to the database. 
And this is Mark's collection of Watchtower literature. He has proved useful in his efforts to expose the organization's abuse. Jose Lopez was seven years old when he was molested by Gonzalo Campos, Campos, a fellow witness whom the local elders had recommended as a mentor, despite knowing that Campos allegedly had a history of molesting young boys. Imagine that. Imagine the elders know about this stuff, but yet they send these child molesters to mentor people, mentor young boys. That's why the watchtower has to be shut down, folks. So we're going to carry on. When Campus assaulted Lopez in the La Jolla, California home in 1986, the boy told his mother, who immediately reported Campus to the elders. They said they would handle the situation and told her not to call the police. Yet, uh, they, they said they would handle it, not to call the police. Yet campus continued to rise in the organization, eventually becoming an elder. Can you believe that? In 2010, he fled to Mexico, where he later confessed in a deposition to molesting Lopez and several other young boys. This is why elders can't look after this stuff. Lopez filed a lawsuit against Watchtower in 2012. When his lawyer, Erwin Zulkin, requested the Watchtower turn over all his documents related to the campus and other known molesters, the organization at first refused, saying it lacked the resources to locate all sorts of information. They lie, and this is just how Watchtower lies and ties up our court times with lawyers. But a senior official for Watchtower later testified that all the information had, in fact, been scanned and stored in a Microsoft SharePoint database. Zulkin introduced a software expert who testified that the Watchtower should be able to produce documents in as little as two days using simple search terms. Still, Watchtower did not comply. The judge grew frustrated and eventually barred the organization from mounting a defense and handed Lopez a $13.5 million award. The appeal court overturned the ruling, saying the judge should have sanctioned Watchtower incrementally and the case was settled for an undisclosed sum in January of 2018. Now you know why the Watchtower has an ad out for lawyers all over the USA. When Zalkin raised the issue of the database in another case against Campus in 2016, the judge ordered Watchtower to pay a fine of 4000 a day until it handed over the documents. Watchtower ranked, racked up a $2 million in charges before settling the case in February of 2018. And there's an asterisk that when you go to the bottom, it says that it still hasn't been paid yet, but I'm hoping it'll get paid now that this case is over. Mark, maybe Mark O'Donnell will let us know what's happened there. Zulkin has once again requested the release of the database document in another California case he's brought on behalf of the former witnesses. Exactly how many alleged pedophiles are named in the database has been the source of a wide-ranging speculation. In 2002, one former elder said that the number was 23,720 because they would have a database and there would be people that would have access to that. And slowly these people are going to wake up Watchtower, so uh, the cat's out of the bag, I'm afraid. So it says here, Watchtower would not comment on the number at the time except to say that it was considerably lower. During the Lopez trial, a Watchtower attorney estimated that the organization had received 775 blue envelopes from 1997 to 2001, but did not say how many it had received since then. Perhaps the most tellingly in 2015, an Australian investigation found the perpetrators listed in the database represented 1.5% of that country's witness population of 68,000. Assuming the percentage is comparable in the U.S., which has a witness population of 1.2 million, the number of alleged American abusers in the database would be 18,000. U.S. authorities have so far taken no action against Watchtower, but other countries have launched investigations. In 2016, a royal commission in Australia found that Watchtower demonstrated a serious failure to protect children, including not reporting more than a thousand 
alleged perpetrators of sexual abuse, more than half of whom have confessed to committing the abuse, and at least 1,800 victims in that country since 1950. In 2014, the UK's Charity Commission opened two investigations, one of which is ongoing. Last year in the Netherlands, then Justice Minister Sander Decker urged Watchtower to conduct an independent investigation into the hundreds of abused allegations received via special hotline. Watchtower declined. By the time Mark told Kimmy about the Conti trial in August of 2014, <clears throat> she, Kimmy, was starting to see things differently too enough that she decided to read the trial script transcript. It was like someone just punched me in the stomach, she told me. It was like this whole this whole cracked the, the, this whole crack happened in my head. It was like this whole crack happened in my head. Mark knew that Kimmy had suffered physical and psychological abuse at the hands of her mother, who was mentally ill. But Kimmy didn't talk about it much. Now she's begun to open up. She told Mark about how her mother would knock her and her two siblings into the bedrooms or the basement for days with no food and only a litter box for a toilet. Wow. How she would keep them up all night by banging on pots and pans and then send them to, the, to school delirious and malnutritioned. She was also physically abused toward Kimmy's father, who worked long hours and was largely unaware of how his wife was treating their children. She would beat us every which way you can imagine, scream at us, cuss at us for hours and hours and hours, Kimmy said. And there was sexual abuse, too, which Mark hadn't known about. My attempts to contact Kimmy's mother for comments, the writer says, were not successful. Like many abusers, Kimmy's mother used animal cruelty to keep her kids from telling anyone. She would drown kittens in the toilet and then hang corpses from a ceiling fan in their bedrooms or place them in a jar by their bed, making the point that she could kill us if we didn't cooperate or we told, Kimmy said. And that's why I'm always trying to rescue cats, she added, laughing darkly. That's some, easy, that's some easy psychology there. So when Kimmy was 12, she was reported to a witness elder that she and her siblings had been abused by their mother. And she was told, go home and obey your mother. <clears throat> but Kimmy did tell. As a 12-year-old, she went to the elders in her congregation for help. They told her she couldn't report her mother to the police because it would make the organization look bad, she recalled. They discouraged her from seeking counseling because a therapist might blame the religion or get the authorities involved. And finally, the elders asked Kimmy a question. If her mother did end up killing her, could that prevent Jehovah from resurrecting her at Armageddon? Of course I said no, Kimmy said rolling her eyes. They told me, go home and obey your mother. She told again at, her, at 15 after she'd been baptized. This time the elders said they would need a second eyewitness before they could intervene. Kimmy offered her brother, who, was, who has corroborated Kimmy's allegations for this story, but was told that his testimony would, wouldn't be credible because he wasn't baptized, the same problem I had with this bloody organization. A crooked, bloody organization. It was my word against my mother's word, Kimmy said. Years later, she would learn that her brother had already reported the abuse to the same elders. And Kimmy had heard of the two-witness rule, but she had assumed it was peculiar, peculiarly of her local congregation. She thought it just applied to her congregation. And when she read the transcripts of the Conti trial, she discovered that it was Watchtower doctrine and had been used for decades to prevent other abused children from getting help. The scales fell off my eyes, she said. Soon both she and Mark would leave the organization for good. Over the next couple of years, the implications of Kimmy and Mark's decision became apparent. 
One of Mark's employees quit. Two of the couple's tenants moved out in the middle of the night. Close friends started uh, stared at their feet when Kimmy ran into them at Walmart. And I went and hid three rows down and cried, she told me. Mark's relationship with his parents always strained, disintegrated. His business faltered. He and Kimmy had some savings to fall back on and would find other tenants. But in his mid-40s, with no college degree or resume, Mark faced an uncertain future. On, on the lark, he emailed Lloyd Evans, the British activist, with the YouTube videos. Mark told Evans of his story and thanked him for the work he had, was doing. To his surprise, Evans wrote back suggesting some online ex-witness groups he should join. Still weary of being labeled an apostate, neither he nor Kimmy had been officially disfellowshipped, though they'd stopped attending meetings, Mark joined Facebook under the pseudonym John Redwood, a homage to Evans, whose pen name was John Cedars, and began finding others with similar stories. As he connected with ex-witnesses around the world, he was struck by his own simi how similar their accounts were to his own. And he began writing about his experiences on Facebook. His posts spurred conversations among former witnesses, giving him a new sense of purpose. In the summer of 2015, the ex-witness community was transfixed by Australia's Royal Commission hearings, live streamed online into sexual abuse into religious organizations. The, co the commission had been trying to get testimony from a member of Watchtower's governing body, the organization's all-male ruling council, which then consists of eight men. Now it's, it has nine. And by a strange twist of faith, one member, Jeffrey Jackson, was in Australia at the time, tending to a sick father. Watchtower had managed to avoid a subpoena by claiming that the governing body was strictly adv adv advisory and played no role in creating policy. Mark, who had obsessively collected Watchtower literature his entire life, had evidence to prove this wasn't true. He dug out a copy of the Branch Organization Manual, an obscure document explaining all the functions of the governing body, and emailed it to Angus Stewart, the lead litigator in the proceedings. Stewart used the manual to subpoena Jackson. So there's, there's the rest of the story on how Jackson got into that Australia court. Good work, Mark. In front of the commission, Jackson became the first active member of the Watchtower's governing body to acknowledge that child abuse is a problem right throughout the community. He also admitted that in most cases, children who make such chain charges against the Watchtower are telling the truth. It was an emotional moment for those whose abused Watchtower had denied. Mark received an email from Stewart saying that the branch organization manual has proved to be crucial in securing Jackson's testimony. Perhaps, Mark thought, his extensive collection of Watchtower uh, Euphemia had his encyclopedic knowledge of the religion could be used for something other than recruiting. Still using his John Redwood, Redwood pseudonym, Mark became a regular contributor to Evans' anti-Watchtower news site, jwsurvey.org. Trey Bundy, who has covered the Watchtower sex abuse scandals for the Centre for Investigative Reporting, invited Mark to speak at a 2017 conference on the topic in London, London that also featured Zalkin in The Attorney and Michael Rezenz, the Boston Globe reporter who won a published publisher prize with his co-workers for their investigation of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. The conference marked the first time that Mark used his real name as an activist, figuring the witnesses he knew in Baltimore were unlikely to hear about the small overseas gathering. Mark also used JW Survey, where he continued writing under his pseudonym to encourage witnesses to expose Watchtower's abuses a call that has yielded hundreds of emails. He just comes off as so sincere and knowledgeable and articulate, says Faith McGinn, a, fourth, a former witness, an abuse survivor who reached out to Mark last April. 
That's what prompted me to finally come forward. Mark has built an international network of abused, disfellowshipped, and aggrieved witnesses whom he connected to the journalist, attorneys, and one other, another, one another. Mark is probably the key XJW in the XJW community, says Jason Wine, the founder of AvoidJW.org. And we use AvoidJW.org all the time for information. You can get all the elders' books on AvoidJW.org. <clears throat> A Jehovah's Witness who has started doubting the religious tenets but not yet left the organization is said to be physically in, mentally out, or PIMO. In 2017, a PIMO man and his girlfriend began walking into Kingdom Halls in Massachusetts, opening locked file cabinets with a set of stolen keys and removing or making copies of sealed documents. They had heard chatter about Watchtower covering up child abuse and at first simply wanted to see the evidence themselves. Most of the documents they took were letters between local elders and Watchtower headquarters or from one congregation to another discussing the alleged sins of individual congregates. One young man was disfellowshipped for stealing candy bars, another for refusing to remove a sign from his van window that said, Beating children violates God's law. Can you imagine that? They got disfellowshipped for that, but yet they allow child pedophiles to be elders. A woman was disfellowshipped for having sex with her ex-husband when he came over to plow her driveway during a snow, snowstorm. But they also gathered dozens of letters dealing with accusations of rape, domestic violence, and molestation, including several questionnaires required by the 1997 Special Blue Envelope letter. In total, 12 individuals are named as suspected child molesters though missing documents make it difficult to piece together some of the stories. Not knowing what to do with the documents, the Pimo man, who has requested anonymity, uh, has prefer, prefers the code name Judas, posted as redacted version of the single letter he had stolen on the ex-Jehovah's Witness subreddit. Just five sentences long, the letter informed Watchtower that a ministerial servant had admitted to physically and mentally abusing his wife for years. In the most recent incidents, he, bear, he beat her so badly that she would have sought medical attention. If it were not for her concern over the reproach, it would bring on Jehovah's name as punishment. The husband had been stripped of his rank and had lost all special privileges like handling microphone at the Kingdom Hall meetings. No mention was made of involving police or taking steps to protect the wife. Judas had blacked out the names of the couples and the congregations, but not the dates. It was just one simple letter that shocked me, Judas told me. I wanted to see if this would get anyone's eyes, who really is important and could tell what I should do with the information. His plan worked. Jason Wine saw that the letter had sent Judas a private message, warning him that he could be exposing himself and others to legal trouble or harassment by posting sensitive documents online. Judas replied asking for advice on how to release his other documents. At Wine's request, Mark reached out to Judas with a plan to release the information while still protecting his identity. Judas went to a distant post office and mailed him the documents in a U.S. priority mailbox with no return address. And he also used secure channels to send scanned copies to Mark and Wine. Though they wanted to eventually leak the redacted versions of every document involving a criminal act, they decided to start with one big story, the case of a witness man from Palmer Congregation in Brimfield, Massachusetts, who allegedly abused his two daughters, and another young girl. The story plays out across 33 letters, 69 pages, all in all between the congregation and Watchtower headquarters. One of the man's daughters said he had tied her down and molested her, and the other said he had raped her repeatedly for nine years. He allegedly took one of his daughters into the woods and showed her where he would bury each of her body parts if she told. The girl who wasn't his daughter said he raped her in his neighbor's mobile home 
when she was four. At first, the elders took only nominal action because one of the sisters refused to accuse her father in person. In 2003, the elders finally disfellowshipped the man after he confessed to molesting one daughter. But he was reinstated a year later, partly because the daughter who had accused him of years of rape refused to answer new questions from the elders, who expressed disapproval in the letters that she and her husband had alerted civil authorities. Wow. Mark and Wine, nervous about trafficking stolen documents, wanted to create another layer of protection for Judas and themselves. So Wine approached Ryan McKnight, the propertyer of Mormon Leaks, a site dedicated to transparency in the Mormon Church. They shared the Palmer documents with McKnight, who used them as an inaugural post for a new site, faithleaks.org, and worked with a reporter from Gizmodo to independently confirm the story. Mark and Wine never shared any details about Judas' identity with McKnight, so that he could honestly say he didn't know who had the stolen letters. On January 9th, 2018, the documents went live on Faith Leaks, and Gizm Gizmodo published its story. Another American outlet picked it up, as did the media in the UK, Finland, Spain, Lebanon, Hungary, Chile, and Bolivia. The Palmer congregation has never made any public comment on, on the abuse or cover-up allegations and didn't return a comment request for the story. A month after the document had appeared online, McKnight received an email from an officer with the Brimfield Police Department and the Palmer congregation had reported the theft of its documents and wanted the perpetrator brought to justice. The officer asked McKnight about the source of the letters he had published, but McKnight had no information to give. So the officer also asked whether McKnight could connect him with one of the victims whose case appeared to fall within the Massachusetts statute of limitations. And McKnight reached out to the victims to let her know that the police were interested in talking with her. In August, I spoke with the police officer who had contacted McKnight and a spokesman for the Hampford County District Attorneys, whose jurisdiction includes Brimfield. Both told me that their offices continued to gather information on the Palmer case, but they could neither confirm nor deny that an investigation into the alleged abuser had been opened. An investigation into the theft of the Watchtower documents is ongoing. Six months after the leaks went public, Mark received a call from his mother, whom he hadn't spoken with in more than a year. His father had been diagnosed with uh, cancer and his treatment wasn't going well. She needed help, she said, though she didn't expect much from her son. Mark felt hurt, not only by his mother's low opinion of him, but also that no one from his old congregation had bothered to tell him about his dad. He and Kimmy immediately became involved in his parents' lives, doing their grocery shopping, driving his father to radiation treatments, and managing his care. They mostly avoided talking about religion with Mark's parents to lift their spirits. Kimmy even gave them one of her favorite cats. For the first time in his adult life, Mark grew close to his parents and Kimmy became a daughter to them. In January of 2019, Mark's father died. Three weeks later on Saturday afternoon, Mark was once again sitting in Baltimore Kingdom Hall. he had attended as a child. Though he and Kimmy had, to their great surprise, still not been disfellowshipped, they did not know what to expect. Both had become vocal Watchtower critics online and no longer bothered to hide their identities. Still, there is an unwritten rule among the witnesses that funerals are a no-shun zone. They were mostly greeted warmly and both were glad to see some old friends. The elder given the eulogy spoke of Jerry O'Donnell, ever-present smile and his endearing habit as of, of a obsessive record-keeping. Later that night, driving back to Mark's house, I asked him about the state of the Judas document, a subject he had put off discussing with me during his father's illness. He said he planned to send the documents describing serious crimes to the relevant local authorities 
and he was excited about more documents he expected to receive soon. I asked him about the picture that he had been on display at the funeral, a faded Polaroid showing a large group of people wading into an above-ground pool in a large empty parking lot. He laughed. That was a picture of his parents' baptism in the parking lot of a stadium in Washington, D.C. Once again, he told me about how his parents became Jehovah's Witnesses after a local couple told him the end of the world was coming. This time, though, he told the story with a tone of forgiveness I hadn't heard before. You have to remember, he said, they were, they were talked into this too. Yeah, we all were. So that's the end of the article, folks. Uh, this article originally stated the Watchtower paid $2 million fine, though the organization did incur that fine. It did not make a separate payment of $2 million to the court once the case was settled. And this article originally implied that a result of being pressured by the elders, the daughter had not contacted civil authorities. So Douglas Quinca is the freelance writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Wired, and the New York Observer, and BuzzFeed. So thanks a lot, Douglas, for, for this article. And uh, that, that brings a, a conclusion to the, uh, the Mark O'Donnell story. That kind of gives us the rest of the story. It's a big story. So th there's a lot of work that our fellow XJWs are doing. And this just goes to show the, um, the backstory of Mark and his wife. And imagine what Kimberly went through as a young child, where their, her mother was beating her, locking her in the basement. And uh, now they're, they're shunned, you know, it's just, um, and, and that's like all of us were shunned. So this is what the fight is about. It's about uh, helping to bring an end to child abuse, shunning, and the blood policy within the Jehovah's Witness religion. I don't think they're going to change. I think they're just going to keep covering things up. I think they're too far in to, to change. And, and that's the problem that we're dealing with the, with the Watchtower right now. So what I say, what I said last time uh, in my last article, there's a get out of jail free card to all of the secretaries and the congregations that are obstructing justice. They could easily make a photocopy, anonymously throw this in to the mail, mail it to the local police. And um, you, know, you could put your name in, um, say, I, I, I want to be anonymous. They'll keep you anonymous, the police. But there's your get out of jail card free. And help put an end to child abuse. Let's help put an end to this. And, and we can work together with those that are inside. They're waking up. Everyone's waking up every day. And we know that this organization is at its last few minutes. This organization is not going to last long uh, in the big scheme of things. So that's the end of today's article. I hope you enjoyed it. And thanks again to the O'Donnells. And until next time, keep living your life with love. So here's a tribute to the O'Donnells. <laughs>